Hey, this is Dickie Lee, and you're listening to Icon Fetch. Welcome to Icon Fetch, the web's premier music interview show. Now, here's your host, Tony Peters. Welcome to the show. Now, long before Justin Bieber, NSYNC, or even David Cassidy, Fabian was one of the original teen idols, scoring big hits in the late 50s and early 60s with songs like Tiger and Turn Me Loose. But the shelf life of a teen idol is a finite one, yet Fabian was able to adapt, becoming a successful and critically acclaimed actor, starring in many films including North to Alaska with John Wayne, Mr. Hobbs Takes a Vacation starring Jimmy Stewart, and Ride the Wild Surf, including Tab Hunter. He's also done many roles on television. Now he's back on the road with a pair of his old buddies, Frankie Avalon and Bobby Rydell, as part of the Golden Boys Tour. So we welcome into the show Fabian. How are you, man? Good, Tony. How are you doing today? Doing fantastic. Fantastic. So, you know, what's kind of interesting is when you first started out, they were calling the music that you were doing, rock and roll, a fad. You know, oh, it was going to be around for a year or two and, and then, you know, whatever. It's, and, I mean, is it, it, it's got to be amazing to be still singing those songs all these years later. I can't get over it, frankly. Uh, it's mainly because of uh, our audience that, uh, you know, brings them back to a certain time in their lives and uh, where they had a few laughs and a few <laughs> had some fun and a little quieter time, uh, I guess, for them and a happier time. And uh, I think that's why the pop music uh, has lasted so long. Right. Ab- absolutely. Now, you know, there you can read any number of things on the Internet, and, you, and, and of course, it's all true, right? It's, but, uh, oh, God. <laughs> but, my, my Wikipedia page is so wrong. I, I'm sure. So, so, I don't know how to sue. Right. I know. I know. So, so, so with that, though, I mean, it, there is, I think, at least part of the truth that you got into the music business in kind of a unique way. I mean, was it true that, in fact— your dad was having health issues, and that kind of, you know, you got, you, you met a very important person at that point, right? Uh, I, I, absolutely. Uh, my father uh, was being taken out in an ambulance. He had a heart attack, and uh, I was obviously taking care of my brothers. I was only 14 and a half then, but my brothers were younger. My mother went with my dad in the ambulance, and uh, my next-door neighbor well, the Stoops in South Philly, they, they, they were joined. Uh, a guy was passing by who owned uh, Chancellor Records who had a good friend that lived right next door to me. He thought it was them who were in trouble, stopped to find out it wasn't. Uh, and, he, you know, Frankie Avalon was on the label at that point, just starting out. And he, he asked me a very weird question. He said, uh, you know, would you like to, uh, you know, uh, get involved in the record business? And I was thinking go to hell, but I probably didn't say that. (laughs) Right. Uh, Well, yeah, I mean, your dad's being carried out on a stretcher. That's the the furthest thing from your mind at this point, right? Right. I mean, you know, I thought it was insane. Uh, Make a long story even longer. Uh, A couple weeks and months go by. My father came home. He was disabled, couldn't work anymore, and uh, my neighbor was bugging me that this guy wanted to talk to me. I said, look, I don't know who this guy is, but if I can make any money to help the family out, I'll give it a shot. Uh, And that's how it started. And that's that's how it started. Um, You know, and and you recorded a couple of singles, and they they weren't successful, or maybe they were just sort of successful. Wait a minute. It's not a question that they weren't successful. They were... Horrible. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, of course they weren't successful. Oh, okay, all right, all right. Well, you know. So, so it got me on the Dick Clark show. Right, 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 right. Now, I mean, that's the thing. I, I just actually, I just got off the phone with Bobby Rydell, and he's on the show as well. And, you know, yeah. I mean, it, you know, and, and I think there is this misconception that if you guys were from Philadelphia, 
there was just sort of this pipeline going on to, to Dick, you know, to Dick Clark. But, you know, he said you had to have a hit. He wasn't going to just take anybody. You had to have a hit. So No, that's not true. Uh, I had to go in and meet him. He sat me down, interviewed me, uh, and there was something that he liked about me, and he put me on without a hit. Consequently, I did I'm a man. I'm a man. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a man. Oh, wow. Oh, well, don't you forget that I'm a man. Which was a minor hit, and uh, that's how it worked for me. Um, yeah. You know, with with you had... Doc Pomus and Mort Schumann were the were the guys that wrote um, several of your early songs, and I mean they yeah, went on to do man and turn me loose, right? And they went on to do great things. I mean, you know, as well, like you know, other like Save the Last Dance for Me, and they did a bunch of hits for Elvis. But at oh, this, yeah. So I'm a man is the first single of yours that actually cracks the top forty, right. um, you know. And at that point, uh, are you thinking to yourself, okay? Maybe I'm going to be sticking with this. You know, you, at first you said the singles weren't very good and they weren't very successful. Right. You know, and then all of a sudden I'm a man gets into the national top 40. You know, what, what's going through your mind at that point? Well, uh, the reaction of the public was very, very nice. And I was able to make a few, not a lot of money, but a few extra dollars to, for my goal to help the family out. And uh, I figured, well, hey, you know, I, I, I'm still a fish out of water because I really don't know what the hell I'm doing. But I'm going to, you know, try to work this out and 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 uh, hang in there. Right, right. And and then and then you do turn me loose. Turn me loose. Turn me loose. I say. This is the first time I ever. Which was amazing. I mean, that's it's it's a. I mean, and then I'm sure, like then, whatever whirlwind you had, just let multiplied it by a hundred times. I imagine. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's it, fame is a very weird thing. I mean, I've been doing a lot of interviews over the years, and I hear a lot of the same things that it's very odd that you know you go from getting doors slammed in your face to then you know suddenly, you know everybody wants a piece of you. It's a it's a very odd thing. It's a very dangerous thing too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, because you might think you're somebody special when, when you're not. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, so I mean, Tiger comes out. And that's like another huge hit. You keep you right. keep going. Now with Tiger, though, that was not um, Doc Pomus and Mort Schumann. Um, yeah, Ollie, Ollie Jones, I believe. Right, Ollie Jones, and this guy had had hits with like Perry Como and Nat King Cole. Like, how did you get hooked up with him with with that song? I have no idea. <laughs> I had, you know, right? <laughs> the managers took care of all that. I okay. have no idea. Interesting. Okay. All right. I mean, yeah. you, you, you know, you were growling on the song. That was that was pretty nice. I like that. So. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, but one of the interesting things is, look, I mean, there is some good stuff in the in the Fabian catalog and some of it is kind of surprising that Mighty Cold was the B-side that's got some yeah. like pretty amazing guitar on that <laughs> you have any, you remember the guy's your name of on the course. there that was that was the great Al Kiowa. Oh wow! Okay, yeah. Yeah. nice. Well, that's that's good stuff. So I mean, yeah, that's some that's some great. You know, it, it, tucked away on a B side there is a, is a, is a track with some uh, some. Yeah, no, I, I had some interesting songs that uh, didn't were on the album. String along. String along. That's all I am is just your string along. Someone that you just seem to bring along. Whenever you are all alone and need some company, you always turn to me. And Mighty Cold and King of Love and some of them were were, were, were pretty good. Now, you have to remember, uh, the technology back then, 
you know, it wasn't like it is now. But I think our producer, uh, P.T. Angelus, who is now deceased, uh, did a pretty good job at what he had, what he had to work with. Yeah, I mean, and, I mean, and, and I believe that if you listen to these records now, I think you know some of them really hold up as as being good early rock and roll records. So, yeah, some don't, but some of them do. You know, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, and I mean, I, I have to bring up Hound Dog Man. That was another huge record. Um, w- right. Was that like uh, you know an attempt to kind of answer uh, Elvis or something like that, or you know, uh, it's kind of interesting that the movie I did called Hound Dog Man was a novel, and a very sweet novel. I don't remember the author, and uh, they made a movie out of it, and I was under contract to tw- just beginning my contract with uh, 20th Century Fox, and I'm sure and Elvis was under contract to 20th Century Fox also to make some movies. And in retrospect, you brought something up that I hadn't really thought about, is that uh, I'm sure the powers that be thought the similarity with the name would help. Okay. And and I'm sure that's how it worked out. Okay. All right. Yeah. You know, if you're looking at 1959 and, you know, go through a Billboard book, you had five charting singles i mean that's just unbelievable they were releasing them one right after another right another i mean that's that's a dizzying amount i don't i don't know how many bands actually release five hit singles in one year uh hey hey tony i want to thank you for reminding me of that i never think about that that's i'm kind of proud of that now. absolutely no yeah, absolutely yeah, yeah. i mean you know if you look at that it go, it starts in january of 59 and goes on you've got five singles all in the year 1959 I'm very happy about that. See, see, it's good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it's good, it's good stuff. But, but I mean, at that time though, that year 1959, I mean, it just. Do, do you remember any of it, or were you just working so much, you know, as a as a young kid it, that it's? It, it was a major blur. I mean, I remember that things were really going kind of great on one aspect, and I was able to really. You know, my father didn't have to worry and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it wasn't mega like today, uh, but it was good money. And I I was able to help out. The other side of that is my management was nuts and uh, very weird. And uh, I had to eventually break off that tie because it it was getting kind of weird. And uh, so I was in turmoil. You know, I was successful, but yet my personal life was really in the garbage can. And uh, I had to make a, I had to make a right turn, and uh, leave that situation. That's why I never recorded after that. So you and, and only made movies, right? So, so you, I mean, you, from what I understand, you turned eighteen and were able to get out of this contract that you had with Bob Marcucci. Uh, the only way you get out of things is money, <laughs> and I had to buy my way out. Wow! Wow! Yeah, yeah. So they had no rule because I thought like if you sign something when you're a minor, I don't know, maybe yeah, they that didn't. Was bull- that was bullshit. <laughs> my 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 guardian was a. Uh, Oh, they they put a guardian on me that was an ex loan shark. Oh boy! Wow. Who was, uh, who was uh, a friend of uh, Bob Marcucci, my manager? It was a weird setup, so I had to get out of it. It wasn't the mafia or anything like that, right? You know what I mean, right? But but it was not cool, right? Right. Now, so you you switched to acting, and I mean, I you... didn't switch. I was still under contract to Fox. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. All right. But but I mean you you start you're, you're doing acting and what do you think about acting sort of was more natural for you? I was blessed, man, with a director named Don Siegel who did all the Clint Eastwood movies. Oh wow! Okay. And when I kind of like did a screen test uh, in the beginning of the film, he was very calm with me and helpful with me. And all of a sudden, uh, I was very comfortable, and I had a knack of reading a script maybe 30 times to, to embed my mind on the character, because I had no acting experience. 
but I just engulfed myself in the words and uh, the dialogue. And for some reason, I was very comfortable and I think natural. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, the the list of uh, you know films you've been in is is an impressive one. I mean, you know, north let's to Alaska. About, let's not talk about the turkeys, okay? <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Was, you know, we, we've got an impressive list, and then we have ones we just won't talk about, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> we'll just forget about those. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you know, you had an opportunity to work with a lot of legendary folks. I mean, you've worked with John yeah. Wayne. You worked with Jimmy Stewart. I mean, there's there's. Bing Crosby. Bing Crosby, right. Yeah. Tuesday World. I mean, a lot of, a lot of, Carol Lindley, a lot of wonderful actresses and actors. Yeah. I mean, and that's, and that's, and and you just sort of maybe felt a little more at home doing that than, than, uh, than the music career kind of thing. I guess you didn't have the screaming girls when you're on the movie set kind of thing. Well, uh, no, no, of course not. But, uh, no, they were very, well, the, the, they were very nice. I mean, like Jimmy Stewart. Uh, he's a guy who would, he would like pull me on side, pull me aside the first day and said, look, uh, you know, I'd like to rehearse. Would you mind rehearsing with me? I'm going, what? <laughs> you know? Right. I mean, is this not incredible? Right. And, uh, people like that just helped me out. Right. What about John Wayne? You can, you can tell me anything about him that, uh, that... Well, John Wayne is what you saw is what you got. <laughs> Okay. He was nice to me. Don't get me wrong, uh, but he, John Wayne, was John Wayne, you know, and they almost drowned me in North to Alaska. That's for sure. <laughs> oh man! Yeah, oh he was, boy, he was, he was quite a guy. Right, right. I mean, and I understand that you know, in in being on the set at the movie. I mean, do you get a chance to meet Elvis? Is that right? Did, did you actually actually meet him? Well, the first time I, I tell this story uh, in the show, which is a true story. Uh, my first one night, my third one nighter. I was in uh, Memphis, Tennessee, in a hotel room, and uh, phone rings, and they said, "Hey, it was Elvis. He wants to talk to you." And I go, "Why?" <laughs> 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 you know, and uh, he said he wanted to meet me. He actually came up to the room. Wow! And. Uh, he was learning karate. I mean, he was very nice. I mean, I couldn't believe it. There was Elvis Presley. And uh, he came up to the room, and uh, the little the true story is that he was learning karate then, and he saw my four backup singers, and he said, hey, I want to practice my karate. Uh, have your guys, uh, you know, try to attack me. <laughs> and okay. Were, this is a true story. Wow. I mean, just, and, you know, they... They were nervous, and they went around them, and, you know, he kicked them all in their ass. <laughs> wow. I, I, and he ripped his pants, and I gave him my a pair of my pants to get out of there. Nice. Okay. I mean, that's a, you know, I love that story because it's true. That's and, great. Oh, man. When I was in uh, on the set in California and uh, making movies, I had a Thunderbird. Uh, with the retractable top that he wanted to come over and see. And that's the other time I met him. And then the last time I met him was when he was at the Hilton in Las Vegas. Wow. We were in buddies, but... Yeah, but you... Nice if I was. How many people can say that you gave a pair of pants to Elvis? <laughs> That's great. Story. That's right. Story. That's awesome. You know, I mean, you you did a lot of movies, and then you also successfully did some television. And I tell you what, I, I you know, with YouTube, you can pull up just about anything. And I tell you what, the the bus stop show, uh, a lion walks among us. That's phenomenal. I mean, how well, did you get how did you get involved in that? Well, they didn't want me for that. Twentieth uh, Century Fox, Robert Altman, the great director, Robert Altman. Google him. He's incredible. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, he, I had to go and audition for that. And I, I went to his house and auditioned, make a long story short. Uh, I guess I did okay because he gave it to me. Now, here's a quote-unquote teen idol playing a murderer who gets away with it on, uh, on the segment. So now it's ready to come out on TV. And the sponsors going, 
we we will not allow this to happen. Wow. We are not going to sponsor this show. That show went on without any sponsors. I had, I, I had heard, yeah, that it was the first TV show to, to just run with no commercials kind of thing. So, wow. Is that amazing? Wow. Huh. Yep. Yeah, I mean, you're you're riveting in that. I tell you what. I mean, I'm watching that going, you're a scary dude, man. <laughs> that's what my dog says, too. <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh, that's that's great. That's great. So, um, you know, it, it, you... You flash forward. You got a you got a star on the rock in, uh the Hollywood Walk of Fame in two thousand two. That had to be a great honor as well. Yeah, I mean, you know, you, you see the people that are on that have those stars. It's kind of a what a compliment. It's amazing. Right, right, absolutely. And you know, I was interviewing Bobby Rydell, and he's got a book. So I mean, you know, I have to ask. Everybody puts out a book. Are you working on a book? No. Uh, really? I, uh, well, I, let me qualify that. I've started it a hundred times. Uh, I don't know. I, I think I would make too many enemies. Hmm. Uh, I don't know. And, and to relive some of the wonderful things is fun. Don't get me wrong. But to relive to relive some of the other things, I, I just not. I'm not in the mood to do that. Right. And I don't feel like doing a book that's just like, oh, well, everything's rosy. Right. No, no. I mean, I, I see that. And I mean, I've, I've talked to a lot of people that have put out uh, autobiographies and they say it's like therapy because you have to go back and relive this stuff and it's painful. So. Oh, God. Yeah. I've tried to. In fact, sometimes I'll, I'll write down a title and stuff like that. And I why am I doing this? You know, this is I'm 73 <laughs> years old. I don't need this bullshit. Right, right, but right. Maybe I'll maybe I'll do it. The only reason I might do it is set the record straight for my children. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, it, I might do it to that. Well, you know, I mean, that's that's probably not a, a, a bad thing, you know, because like you say, there's a lot of false information out there. Right. And trying to fight that sort of, you know. You can't fight it. You can't fight it. Yeah. And, I, I, I have to bring up on, you know, like you said, YouTube, there's amazing things that you can pull up. And there is a segment of you on American Bandstand. And... Dick Clark is interviewing you, and it's like I think 1964, and at that point he's saying he's gonna he's gonna um, you know be taking a break, and you're gonna be on the um, on the tour. You're gonna like take the the place of him on the Caravan of Stars. So you were actually the host of of that Caravan of Stars yeah. for okay, yeah, for a couple of years. Yeah, I, I did that for Dick. He was uh, on doing other projects, and they asked me to do that for him and uh of course i did it <laughs> right right you know but what i think is interesting is that here it is 1964 and you already seem kind of weary of everything like he's asking you when are you going to get back into the singing business and you're like never say never dick but i'm not real interested in that i mean you just seem very i'm just well, you, you bring up record contracts and everything like that's that's it's it's kind of wild that here you are i mean at that point you're probably maybe early 20s or something like that and it's just it's it's a i don't know it's a, it's amazing s snapshot in time kind of thing yeah i mean i was kind of burned out you right know, by, that, by that experience uh plus the fact uh critics weren't very kind to me and uh and, and in some cases justified like the first two records i made so i didn't really feel like going through that again and uh, so I guess that's that's what did it. Although, remember Lee Hazelwood? Yes. These boots are made for walking. Absolutely, yep. He was a neighbor of mine in Saluka Lake, and we got together with Billy Strange, the great guitar player, and he coerced me after we had a half a bottle of bourbon <laughs> to uh, do a couple songs that he wrote. And they were fantastic. And I don't know where they are now, but I wouldn't let him put it out. <laughs> you know? Wow. And what and what year would this have been, you think? I mean, was I this have no idea. like late 60s? I mean, maybe? I was, okay. I was living in, in, in that I had, let's see, my, I don't know. I don't know. I don't remember. Okay. It, wasn't, it was in the 60s. <laughs> right. Late okay. Late 60s. All right. Yeah. Interesting. So, and I'll also, I, to set the record straight, to, 
like the politicians say, to make this perfectly clear. <laughs> right. Uh, I was under management uh, after that other bull with Pat Boone's manager, and we tried a couple songs, and they went out, uh, kind of went out, but never really did anything. Okay. All right. Interesting. So, I mean, you know, you, you flash forward, you have been doing this Golden Boys uh, bandstand tour with Frankie Avalon and Bobby Rydell. This started back in 1985. I, I can't imagine that when you started that, that you're thinking, oh, yeah, we're going to be doing this all these years in the in the future kind of thing. Well, I'm sure Rydell told you we only thought it would last about a year. Right, yeah, right. You know, and, uh, well, it's not. it wasn't up to us. It was up to the audiences. Right. They were, I mean, phenomenal. And they've kept it going. Those wonderful people for over 30 years. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what it's all about, is making you know making people happy. And as long as the crowds are still there, I imagine you're going to still do it, you know? People talk about, well, why don't you retire? I go, then what the hell do I do? <laughs> right, right. You know, and then, I mean, I, how much grass can I cut on my tractor? Right, you know right, I mean? right, right. Yeah, I hear you. And you know what? I mean, like you said, you've cut back. So, I mean, it's like, yeah. what? I mean, and I don't know. I mean, it. it I find it funny that, you know, it, years ago there was all this talk about, well, you know, how old is too old to be, you know, playing rock and roll? I mean, you know, in 81, the Rolling Stones did their farewell tour. Well, how did that work out? You know, it's like, that's right. like you know, and it's, it's so, I mean, as long as you're having fun, as long as you still got the crowds, you know, I think, I mean, look at Tony. We're still having a hell of a lot of fun. Right. The two guys, Avalon and Rydell, are just fun to be with. I mean, we're totally all different and we all get along so beautifully it's wonderful and you i mean you guys were all grew up in the same neighborhood i mean was there something in the water in south philadelphia what do you think <laughs> it was the bread all right the bread no, no i'm kidding <laughs> oh, well i don't know what i mean you know jimmy darren mario alonza i mean there's so many people that came from philadelphia just like uh, brooklyn and chicago and Little little certain pockets of people in Nashville, you know. Right, and, right. And South Philly was kind of like the same way. I have no idea why. Right, right. Well, the the advent the advent of Dick Clark being there certainly helped. Sure, absolutely. It didn't hurt. That's for sure. So, but uh, all right. Well, Fabian, it was good talking to you, and uh, looking forward to to seeing you as part of the uh, Golden Boys tour. Are you going? To, are you going to come to the show? Absolutely, going to be there for sure. All and, right, well. Be nice to meet you, Tony. Yep, that would be that would be great too. Well, hey, I uh, I appreciate you talking to us. We'll uh, we'll give a good push for the show. Um, Thank you. You've been listening to Icon Fetch with Tony Peters. Want more great interviews? Head over to IconFetch.com. There, you'll find every interview we've ever done, plus CD reviews, this day in music, and a random album of the day. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter. Who is Tony going to interview next? It could be you. Send what you've got to Tony Peters. Icon Fetch, P.O. Box 292134, Dayton, Ohio, 45429. Or email Tony at host at iconfetch.com. Until next time, this is Joe Kelly. Have a great day.